I had the greatest job in the world, and that's working with dogs. Best in show winner is the French Bulldog. Winston won the National Dog Show. It was amazing, it was exciting. And to have a dog to be number one dog in this country, you have to have great nutrition. And I always fed Pro Plan, just like us. When we eat well, we feel good. And I just love that food and what it's done all these years to all the dogs I've bred and all the dogs I've shown. Welcome to Pure Dog Talk. I am your host, Laura Reeves. And I have a guest for us that we've visited with before, but this is a little different topic. So we're talking to Kelly Lynn Marquis. And in the past, we, we had a conversation about some personal life coaching and some other things that she was doing. And now we're going to talk about her new book. Very exciting. Behind the scenes of Best in Show, Intimate Moments with the Masters. So welcome, Kelly. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to actually be able to talk about my book because I spent four <laughs> years writing it all by myself at dog shows at Panera Bread in my kitchen. And I was like, finally, I get to talk to people about this. It's, it's often a labor of love. I understand. I understand entirely. So talk to us a little bit about, because I thought what you talk about in the introduction and things I thought was really interesting about why you wanted to do this particular book. Well, one of the, there are so many reasons, but I'm going to go with the first one that pops into my head. Um, and the first one being that I chose several different examples of mastery, people that have excelled in their career mm -hmm. and the reason being able to choose that many different examples I thought was very helpful because people can identify with different aspects of certain people mm -hmm. and how Michael Scott became a mastery and how he walks his path of mastery versus how Kaz does or perhaps how Gwen did. Um, we all have our own unique way and in how we walk that walk and in that we we may choose to explore the path different and when we for me being able to talk to these different people and seeing how they go about it it opened my eyes to different areas that maybe i haven't explored or i thought wow what if i what if i thought about life the way michael does how might my life be different or from Gwen's perspective or from, from Janice or from Michelle. So I, that was one of my goals in bringing in all these different people. And another goal of mine that I had as well was at the time when I started writing, I was seeing some dissension, sometimes some frustration where I would hear people saying things about handlers doing all the winning and you know i really really wanted to show all of the work that goes into those wins and even you know for many of us that you see in the book for so many of the masters it's not about the wins right. actually not one of them it's not one of them right. mentioned about the win being something that matters to them it's the behind the scenes things that matter to them, whether it's, you know, making their clients happy or the connection that they have with that dog. And that, you know, that was a motivation. <laughs> right, right. Well, and I think it was really interesting to me as I was reading through the book, it's a lot of the same types of information I'm trying to per get across on Pure Dog Talk, right? Like helping people understand that judges weren't hatched from eggs, right? Or that, when you're when you're talking about people that are that are masters at their craft they literally are masters at a craft and and that that takes effort and time to develop and so talk to us about some of the things that you saw right when you were talking to these people that are transferable if you will that that really are something that someone could pick up and and say okay i can you use this right in my process of what I'm trying to achieve. So transferable, can you be a little more specific? So, so something that you, when you were talking to say Michael Scott, 
right? So what is something that Michael Scott does? What is part of his path, for example, that you thought other people could um, take on for their own path or adjust or adapt or, you know, like that? It's interesting to me that you chose Michael um, because it's is a great way for me to answer the question. Michael was so hard for me to wrap my head around because he's his priorities were very different than mine and the way he sees the industry was very different than my background. Uh, my background was one as a breeder and Gwen was my primary mentor and coming from that framework, um, you know, there are thoughts that we have in our head that shape how we show up in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Gwen's, Gwen got very, when someone didn't judge her breed properly as, as she felt, um, it, it should have been judged. She got very angry at them and she saw herself as a protector of the breed. That's part of Gwen's identity is I am a Doberman person. This is my breed. And as, for Dober listeners who maybe don't know just the casual reference, Gwen DeMilta. Gwen DeMilta, yes. And Gwen DeMilta has contributed to the sport of purebred dogs in the Dobermans that she bred. The, just a very powerful figure in the Doberman world. And Gwen, like many of us Doberman people, we can be very protective and possessive and, you know, we are Doberman-y <laughs> and someone stepping into our ring, our territory, yeah. and they don't judge it properly. Well, you better be prepared yeah. for, a, you know, you better have a strong background, you know, backbone when you step into the Doberman ring. Um, it, at least that's the way it used to be historically. Times are changing. And so that was the line of thinking and i worked with gwen and this was about my breed and a judge judging it right and it became very personal at times mm -hmm. and being able to speak with michael where michael's michael is very much a businessman yeah. and to michael it is his job to handle the dog to the ability and to bring that dog to the right judges and he knows his judges well he knows what they like as does gwen did gwen but michael's job was very his job to handle there isn't there wasn't the messiness that i would see in gwen and that also was active in myself as well so when i interviewed michael and michael said my job is to handle the dog and to bring it to the right judges, period. Right. And, and he even went on to say that, look, it's a game. And, and that really triggered me because I thought, no, this is serious business. And, and it isn't that Michael doesn't take it seriously, but he's very, very clear on what his role is mm -hmm. as a handler. That was one of the things that, really struck me interviewing Michael was if Michael had been my mentor and if I operated and navigated the dog show world with Michael's mindset, mm -hmm. how might my life be different? Mm -hmm. So that was very, th that is one of the, the values that I think a reader can get from reading this book where when you see where someone's priorities are and how that shapes how they navigate the world. What if I were to see things a little bit differently or practice this more like Michael does? Um, another example with Michael that really, again, triggered me when I was trying to write about him, it, it, I really had to step outside of Kelly and I had to really try to understand who Michael was and, and I'm, am someone of integrity. So I mean, I, I really wanted to understand Michael and Michael also has this perspective. The, <laughs> so when I, when I first asked Michael in the interview about his success and he says, oh, 
It just, it just happened. <laughs> and I thought, what do you mean, Michael? It just happened. I mean, I am someone that I work hard and I have to overcome. And there was a lot of force to my younger Kelly was trying to prove and make something happen. And Michael make something happen. And Michael says, oh, you know, it just, it just sort of happened. I just sort of fell into it. And I thought, wow, I just, <laughs> okay, wrap my head around Michael. And it was such a gift to me. I learned so much writing this chapter because there is this way that Michael navigates life where Michael's able to, to sort of step into life and say, what's, what's going on around me? Okay, well, how can I make this work for me? And then when he sees what's working, oh, well, I, you know, I, I came back, I take, he, Michael had stepped away from showing dogs and then ended up coming back, then ended up going, an opportunity came up to go work for, for uh, Pat Craig Trotter. And so he went off to the West Coast to work for her. And while he was out working for Pat, his parents made the decision to retire. And many of his clients said, well, where's Michael? How, how about if you retire, we just hire Michael? And my, my recollection is it went something along the lines of his parents thought, well, you know, sure. You know, we'll ask Michael. He's, he's out on the West coast. Not sure what his plans are. They mentioned it to Michael and Michael's great. Sure. And so that's how Michael fell into it. Right. And so Michael had um, a history with some parents that were very well connected. They were connected with the Forsyths and with Andy Clark and some, some very, um, some icons mm -hmm. in our sport. And so he did have a great foundation. And then if you know, Michael, if you know a bit about his parents and then what Michael did, you know, Michael then stepped into it and, and then took that to a whole new level. So in, in that chapter where I got playful was that, that life happened to Michael and then he happened to life. You know, he stepped in and he started, he, he knows where to see that things are working and then to start influencing. That's where he really shows up. I hope that makes, makes sense. It does. And actually, I think one of the things Kelly might take away from, uh, from that conversation and from a lot of the, some of the people that I've talked to that kind of the same thing kind of come from the background is when we're able to remove our, selves, right? Our emotion. And this applies to handlers. This applies to breeders. This applies to owner handlers, baby dog people, everybody. If you can remove the emotion, right? Take your ego out of it and just do the job, whatever that job is, whether if you're an owner handler, it's not a paying job, but it's still a job, right? You still have the job of presenting this dog to the very best of its ability. And it is, I've talked about it before, to me, amazing when we're able to do that. And I was always so much more successful as a handler showing other people's dogs. When I showed my own dogs, right, my, my feet, my, I got up in my feelings. I got my little feelers hurt, right? <laughs> so, yes. Um, I think that that for me is, is what I'm talking about, a transferable thing. That's something that we can take away as whoever we are out here in listener land and hear that and think, how can I apply that in my own interaction in the dog world? Yeah, I, um, I love that. And I have, I have two thoughts on that. One, I 100% agree with you when it comes to the, the passion and the, the emotional attachment, I, I always give credit to the owner handlers and, and let them know that when it comes to my own dog, I have to have another handler show it because it gets messy. And I can't it watch. I messy. cannot watch. <laughs> and and I, I was just talking with Cindy Huckfelt about uh, when Gwen had her own bitch named Perfect that she was showing in the bread by class. And I have never in my life seen Masterful Demilta be such a hot mess. I mean, it was so laughable. And then Gwen asked me if I could show her and then, of course, I, I wanted to 
I would have loved to have helped out Gwen, but then I realized that I would have been working so hard to try to make Gwen happy that if Gwen saw me showing her, I was going to be a hot mess too. So, so Gwen ended up deciding to send her bitch perfect out to Cindy Huckfelt and Cindy. And and so Cindy was able to do the job of the handler. Less pressure, right? Without the emotional involvement. So I think there's a takeaway right there. Um, Right. And we're able to assess the situation. And, and this is, you know, one of the things that I love about handlers that I think is a lesson for, um, well, even for others, to, for ourselves to bring out into the world, but we're, we're masters of our emotion. It's like you, okay, we, we look at this, what do I need to be? How do I need to show up for this dog? Yep. And we're very clear about that mm-hmm. and not having those roles. Um, we have a very clear role. And we're able to be in integrity and we're also able to look at that dog and go okay what's going on with you you and i you know we need to well to make this work the the beauty to me of working with a really good really professional handler is that they are able to take away the emotion and and assess the dog and say this is good this is bad right here's your faults here's your virtues This is what I'm going to concentrate on. This is what I'm going to do to de-accentuate this other thing without having it all up in your feelings, right? And I think that that is an unremarked upon virtue of the professional dog handler. Yeah, we don't have the luxury to have an emotional moment, Mm -hmm. which, which also gets me thinking about another motivation for my book. I wanted to show our humanity because we when we're at a dog show we need to be in business mode we're not showing our feelings you know michelle scott talks about how difficult it can be for her at times managing her expectations and how she knows she wants to make people happy and it can be so disappointing when you're not able to make that person happy but we can't show that we have to show up and we have to be professionals Mm -hmm. but it but it doesn't mean that we don't feel things. It just means that when when we're in business mode, we need to we we can't be getting caught up in those places. But but we do have feelings, just like everyone else. <laughs> we we are people too. I say that a lot. Yeah. Dog handlers are people too. Um, yes. And actually, I think one of my favorite ones from the book that that to me illustrates that because it's one of my closest friends, it's Taffy McFadden, in terms of people in the sport that that I'm around, that I appreciate, that I emulated, that I, you know, I I stalk Taffy. And I know Janice has talked about stalking Taffy. I mean, we all have. Because of her real humanity, her real down-to-earth humanity. And and I thought that, that that was something that you touched on in that chapter about Taffy. I'm glad you brought that up. I had someone else bring up the Taffy chapter and I felt I was afraid I didn't do her justice. There's, there's so much to Taffy. There's a lot of depth there. (laughs) There's a lot of depth there, but the fact that somebody else brought it up, I'm just going to trust that I, I touched upon it enough that others are seeing it. But another um, person that spoke to me about her said, what I really loved about Taffy is you made reference to the fact that she was running number one dog all breed and yet so humble, so humble. And being able to talk and sit with someone like Taffy, again, had my younger self met with someone like Taffy that her, her, her wisdom, in the industry just emanates off of her and to be able to say look i love dogs i don't love all dogs you know there are certain dogs that i just don't have that connection with and you know that that dog is for bill Mm -hmm. i thought to myself you know when i was younger i don't i didn't have a dog show partner so i thought it was my job to be all and everything to every dog and every person and i thought wow there's such wisdom where Taffy can say, you know, I'm not feeling the connection with this one. This isn't the fit for me. Mm-hmm. And also for me, the 
Taffy was one of my first people to interview. And I also have um, a very spiritual side of how I feel that these dogs impact our lives. And we see ourselves as dog show handlers and there's the small what's going on in the dog show. But then to me, the spiritual is the bigger picture and what this means as a whole. And, you know, these animals that come into our lives and change them. Mm -hmm. And in Taffy's chapter, you know, I, I opened up the interview with Taffy talking about spirituality, hoping that we could touch on that. And Taffy just said, handling is a spiritual experience for me. You know, these dogs, that come in they're so masterful and i learned so much from them and that was one of the things i loved about taffy is she here's this person campaigning for number one dog all breed and she's talking about how she doubts herself when she wakes up in the morning and she goes to a new dog show am i good enough and it it really helped relieve a valve in me that I can actually hold space for, yes, yes, I, I doubt myself, it's there. And look at Taffy, this person that I look up to and I respect, she has it too. And so it helps remove some of my own judgment of when self-doubt is showing up for me. It's like, wow, look at everything she's done. You know, maybe I just accept that there are times that I'm doubting and that's okay. It, it just means that this is really important to me. I want to do well here, and I'm just not sure if I'm good enough, and that's okay. True Panion is revolutionizing medical insurance for pets by providing the best possible experience to our members. And it's not some space age dream, it's happening now. We pay your veterinarian directly while you're checking out, and we're the only ones who can, which means you have decisions in seconds, and you don't have to wait for reimbursement. So unlike with other providers, you'll keep more money in your pocket. Ask your veterinarian if Trupanion can pay them directly. Because there's pet insurance, and then there's Trupanion. I'm Laura Reeves, the host of Pure Dog Talk, and I'm coming today to talk to you about Brilliant Pad. And it is amazing and an incredible way for me to do my potty training with the puppies and not ever have to touch any yucky stuff. Brilliant Pad literally rolls the mess up and you never touch it. So I really wanted to talk to you guys about that, share with you the experience I had with it. It's like the most amazing thing you've ever seen. Well, and I think, again, this is another one to me of these transferable bits. Right. So if you're out there in reader land or listener land and you're going to the dog show and you're showing your dog and you are doubting. Well, OK, here's Taffy McFadden and this is how she handled it. And I think that for me, when I talk to people, my my sense of what I want to do is is share. Right. To share that with people. And I think that that's what some of this can do is help people really gain strength, gain insight, gain confidence from people who are masters of their craft and still experience these same exact human emotions. Mm -hmm. And then when you have someone like Jane Foresight, you know, when I'm getting into these, a, a lot of this exploring the different handlers, is being able to do a deep dive into their personalities mm -hmm. and what motivates them and then being able to see how those motivate motivators and their values and how that shapes how they show up as a professional and how they show up um you know just as a human mm -hmm. you know in jane i mean this woman it, it such a powerful powerful woman and the level of integrity that she brought into everything and this is someone that boy she showed up to win oh, yeah. and it was always showed up to win and i didn't know jane and in many ways maybe 
I don't know if it was helpful or not. I had to ask lots of questions and trying to wrap my head around this, again, this godlike icon that people have such reverence for. Uh, you know, there's a part of me thinking, well, she, I mean, could she possibly be that amazing? And yet time after time after time, the level, level of integrity that she brought and, and then I just think she's a role model for all of us to see that when we bring that level of integrity into all we do, she is still impacting generations of handlers. Mm -hmm. And when I had the idea to write my book, I, I wasn't thinking Jane, I wasn't thinking about writing about Annie Clark and Jane Forsythe and Annie Clark were so foundational when in the lives of Michael, Cause, Andy Litton, it, they they still speak their words and all that they learned. And boy, Jane, Jane wanted to win, and she took her job seriously. She. And she wanted to do right by her clients, by the dogs, by the people. And if you worked for Jane, you better show up and you better work hard. And because that's the expectation. And one of the things that I loved about, for me, there, there are moments when I get this hit in my body of, boy, I wish I could ask Jane about that. But I got such a hit when Sue told me about her receiving a B from a nun. And Jane just said, I am not a B student. And she walked out and she never looked back. She knew her worth. And I thought, what if we all knew our worth the way Jane did? And, and, and Jane just created this community. Uh, Sue Forsythe talked about inviting, you know, that, that Jane would invite people for gatherings and the dog show community, they were her family and she took care of them. And uh, Pam DeHeater mentioned to me that when she was a young handler, Jane Forsythe asked her to cover a dog of hers. And Pam said she was so honored, right. like so honored to be able to help someone. Right. And, and she did, she helped Jane. And apparently sometime later, I think Pam was going to Gwen's wedding so she wanted to go to the wedding she was going to have to to miss um showing some dogs she asked gwen to, um jane to help her and jane Forsythe covered pam's dogs mm -hmm. and pam said that when she went to a gathering at jane's she, i think she expected jane to even like talk down to her and that was not how jane treated people and she just, the way that woman showed up for herself and for others and in the community, it was so powerful. And I think we're missing leadership like Jane right now. Yeah, I think that, I, I think it's out there. I think people just need to hear it and they yes. need to find it and they need to appreciate it when they do because the, the flip side of that leadership is it isn't always soft and fuzzy. Um, no. A lot of sharp edges that come with it and people need to accept that there's some, there's the, the, the path to success is not strewn with roses. And I think for me, you know, that would be sort of another takeaway, right? Like it's hard work and people aren't always going to be nice to you and you're not always going to get a participation trophy. And that can be really tough. And so how we talk about that inside our community to encourage new people to stick around and how we address that question, I think is, is really, really important. Um, because, you know, scaring people off with those sharp edges isn't useful. And yet, right, there's still no participation trophies. So I think that that kind of balance is really important and, and something that we can take away from that conversation as well. Well, I love you going down this road because another 
motivating factor for me is this is our community and I'm looking around and it's a, it, it's scary. It looks like a dying community. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, excuse me, it's a retirement facility. Well, and, and I believe that it, it, this is an underlying theme in my book as well, is that we are people there are people at the ends of those leads and we need to be taking care of ourselves and our community better. And so that can mean, you know, I I know we get on these kicks, even with self care. One of the things that I've learned, even as being a mom, being a mom was my number one priority. And if my work is getting me so strung out that when my daughter comes home from school that I can't hold space for that because I'm too agitated myself, then I'm not able to be the mom that I want to be. And so even as handlers, when we show up at our job, are we making good choices for ourselves so that we can serve not only ourselves, but more people? And sometimes that means, um, in my case, I had to let go of a lot of clients that, you know, I was, I'd worked for them for 20 years, 25 years, but boy, these were people that they rode me, they rode my help. They were, they were never happy. They were never satisfied. And it was really hard letting those people go, but I needed to do it for me and I needed to do it for the people that worked for supported me, my assistants, my peers, um, because I expect myself to maintain a certain level of um, integrity and positivity. And not every day can be positive, I understand. But sometimes if we're not honoring what we need and the type of people that we want to be surrounded by, we're, we're bringing ourselves down. And so making better choices for ourselves so that we can show up the way that we want to is, is really important because a lot of handlers, like when I talk about uh, Katie Bernardin's chapter, you know, and Katie Bernardin gets into, you know, having to change up from showing, you know, a Labrador to a giant schnauzer to an, a, a Springer to a um, Cavalier and having to go through all these different breeds, you're going through all these different temperament changes. You need to show up differently for every single dog. Well, that goes for our clients too. the owners. I was just going to say, and the owners. So one of the things you said earlier that is just always amazes me, people are like their dogs, right? So I showed a lot of Akitas and the Akita standard says that the breed is other, it's dog aggressive. The standard says they're dog aggressive. And I used to always say that Akita breeders were like their dogs. They were other breeder aggressive. It was really a rough, rough group early on. I think it's gotten a lot better. But it's that type of thing. If you have to go from Akita to Clumber Spaniel to Irish Wolfhound, it's exactly what you're talking about. It's, it is the people and the dogs all change. And so I think that that is 100% on point. And so, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm working on coming out of the closet because I know I'm not the only one. And I could even hear with, uh, you know, Jan is talking about her animal communication. Yeah. I had this, uh, this is a client that I had worked for, for a lot of years and, you know, a very likable person and the dog that he wanted me to show, you know, he kept saying, Oh, you know, what's, what's going on? I think you need to take her. And you think I need to take you, take her. I think I need, I think you need to take her. And I got very clear what that dog was telling me. There's depression. Um, I, I, and the dog was in such a depressing environment and I'm not meaning to, to shame the owner, you know, depression is not a pleasant thing to live with, but I'm sure you can relate to what I'm saying, Laura, this, what I started saying to the owner, you know, I'm like, Oh boy, can I say this to the owner? Like, but I'm like, I, I know this owner is probably on, you know, it, on depression medicine and it, it's, a, it's affecting the dog. The dog is in such a depressed environment. Right. And so I said, well, 
um, Bob, you, you know, I think what would really benefit your dog, what I'm getting from her is, you know, it's take her out, play ball with her. She wants to play. She needs you to be interacting. You're, you're wanting it to be my job to bring this out of her, but she's actually your dog. And, and if you were able to show up at the shows in a more joyful place, your dog might be more happy to go into the show ring. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I'm getting so much about what's going on with, with these dogs. And, you know, then as the handler, we can, we can feel these things. A lot of us handlers, and you're probably the same way, Laura, we're empathic. Yeah, yep. <laughs> I can, this, and, and there's a, and I, for, for those of, I'm, I'm going to explain the difference because I, I um, had met with someone a couple of years ago and, the, and he said to me, he said, oh, I'm an empath. And I, and I said, oh, well, what does that mean? Because people can get this confused. And so to me, the way I describe an empath is when I connect into my dog, I can feel things in my body with what's going on in their body. I can feel what they're feeling. Um, and I think it's important for dog show handlers, for those of us that don't know who we are or know how we operate to understand that this is a very real thing. Mm -hmm. And just because many other people in the world don't operate like that, um, we do. And so this person that I was talking to, when I asked him more about being an empath, I, I didn't point this out to him, but he, he was very sympathetic with, with what someone else is going through. And so, you know, if you can have sympathy, you can identify with someone's feelings and you can understand them, but you are not feeling their feelings. Correct. And, and so the more that I've stepped into owning the fact that I am an empath, there are people that it's just not healthy for me to work with. Uh, you know, so there are just people that I have to say, you know, this, this is not a bad person, but someone like this depressed person could go work with Gwen, not a problem. Gwen, Gwen was a knower, like knowing dropped in. She knew something, she followed it, but she wasn't a like, oh my God, I can feel everything going on. And so one of the, this is especially since Gwen has passed on, she's become even more of a like role model when I try to channel her mm -hmm. to be, to sometimes not be empathing and to just be able to shut that off and be in my knowing and to be strong. Mm -hmm. and, and because there is a, you know, I do my life coaching, so it's just, I, I'm always coaching myself. <laughs> Um, and one of the reasons I, I, I just, I love it. It's improved my life so much. And one of the things I talk about is, you know, there's no, I'm not going to say that being an empath is better than, you know, being a knower. There are certain advantages. And so for me, when I, now that I've identified that I am an empath, I do two things with that. I go more deeply into my empathing and I'm saying, what more is there that I can explore? And then I also say, how can I um, develop my abilities as being more like Gwen and to just command and to just know. And when I show up, I am me and you are you and let's not mess, let's not mix that up. So getting, I, I call that being cleaner with my energy. Mm -hmm. And so, so again, this coming back to when you said you talked to all these different masters is being able to identify different aspects that each of those handlers bring to the table and to say, you know, where am I strong and where can I use more development? And for me, I could use more development in being more like Gwen, being more like Jane, being more like Michael, because for me, the like Janice and Michelle, I, they're feelers and I understand them. Right. I really understand them. Right. So I went off on a tangent. It's, it's all good. And I think, you know, out there in listener land, I think this has been an amazing conversation with Kelly. I thank you very, very much for sharing all of this with us. 
And um, the book is coming out soon? April 9th. April 9th. Okay, so so you guys, Bolo, um, will it be available on Amazon? Where are people? Amazon. Amazon. Yes. All right. Behind the scenes of Best in Show, Intimate Moments with the Masters. Kelly Lynn Marquis, thank you. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Laura. It was a pleasure.